Hello, Code Camp. How's everybody doing out there? Now, uh, I'm Dylan, and I like to do things backwards. Normally, people do the talk, and they introduce all the concepts and everything, and then right at the end, they do a live demo. And we're going to do the demo at the beginning. So what I want all of you to do is uh, you need to go to this web address on your phone. When you do, you will get some instructions. There are two very important instructions. One of them, you are going to see a button. The button says, do not push this button yet. Do you understand what that means? The second one is you are going to get instructions telling you to stand up. So when you get to that point in the instructions, you stand up. Now I'm going to switch over to my live analytics dashboard display here. That's nice. And uh, there we go. So that the person in yellow there, they didn't follow the instructions. So we'll, we'll give that a moment. No, I don't see anybody standing up, which either means that the system isn't working or people aren't. There we go. We got one at the back. Yep, 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 yep. Good. I, I see it. You're getting it. It's all right. Nobody wants to be the first person to stand up because nobody wants to be that. What if it's a trick and it's, it's only me? But uh, that's cool. So what we're going to do, we're just going to rack this up till basically till the screen is full because that'll be like a statistically significant number of participants in this experiment, all right? And so there we go. That's kind of slowing down. OK, so I know we got another row. Let's let that one get across to the end. And then uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to count us down from three. And when I get to zero, because this isn't Visual Basic, we're going to three, two, one, zero. And when I get to zero, I want you all to push the button, all right? So three, two, one, push the button. Look at that. So we've got a whole load. The blue ones are queued. The yellow ones have been sent. And once it's been sent, go and check your email. And then what will happen, this will update. If the email went to your inbox, you hit the button. It goes green. You can sit down. If the email went to your junk mail, you hit the button. It'll go pink. We go on here. You can sit down. Now, there we go. This is, this is working. Some people are getting it. Some people aren't getting it. Some people are getting a bit uncomfortable. They're like, what if, what if it doesn't arrive and I just have to stand here forever? Now then, I have some news for you, some good news and some bad news. The good news is that everything is working perfectly. Now, we rely on email for all kinds of things, right? Like, I went to log into Photoshop this morning. Like, log into Photoshop, what is that? Uh, anybody still stood up, by the way, remember who you are, but you can sit down now. That's all right, you don't need to stand up for the whole thing. Um, I went to open Photoshop this morning. It said, oh, to confirm your identity, we'll send you a verification code. And I'm like, oh, well, and you go into your email, refresh, 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 and there it is, and you type the code in, or you know, you're like, oh, I've got to go to the airport. Where's my plane ticket? Oh, I need to get it in my email, refresh, refresh. And we kind of expect that email is just going to be like immediate, right? This is RFC 5321. This is the specification, the latest version of the spec for internet email. Now, what this says is you've got to try the email once. And if it doesn't work the first time, the retry interval should be at least 30 minutes. And if it doesn't work, keep retrying. The give up time needs to be four or five days. So this is the spec that tells us how to build email systems. And it says, try once. If anything goes wrong, you know, the Wi-Fi's down or whatever, yeah, come back in half an hour and keep trying till the end of the week. And then maybe you can conclude that the email didn't work. Now, those of you who your email didn't come through, there's a bunch of reasons why that might have been the case. The good news is that all of you can come up at the end and you can collect one of these. This is the sticker that should have been an email, a little self-adhesive souvenir of this talk. But what I'm going to do today, I want to tell you the story of email. I want to tell you how we ended up at this weird place in technology where we have a standard that says something can take five days, but the internet relies on the fact that it'll take five seconds. And we're going to start here. 1969. Now, if the United States of America was a television show, 1969 would have been like a season finale because they pulled out 
all the stops. The US did so much amazing stuff. 1969 was Apollo 11, the first time human beings walked on the moon. It was the maiden flight of the Boeing jumbo jet, the 747. It was the year the Lockheed SR-71 Blackbird hypersonic spy plane flew for the first time. It was the year of Woodstock, three days of you know peace and music and love and this amazing festival. And it was the year that we invented the internet. Except it wasn't called the internet yet. It's called the ARPANET, the Advanced Research Projects Agency Network. Now, the ARPANET was this kind of, there were networks prior to this, but they were made of computers that talked to each other. It was peer to peer to peer to peer networking. The ARPANET was the first time we really had this concept of are you on the network? Are you online? Can you connect to the net? Yes or no? And as uh, soon as we started connecting computers together, people started going, oh, well, uh, if my computer can talk to your computer, I can send you messages. Now, <coughs> modern email is the culmination of hundreds of people working on all kinds of different technology for a long, long time. But one of the most influential contributions came from this guy. This is Ray Tomlinson. And uh, Ray was working on one of the earliest messaging systems. 1971, uh, he's in Massachusetts, and he's building an electronic messaging system for the ARPANET. And Ray was the guy who said, why don't we use at as the user at the host? And early email addresses looked like this, alice at MIT Multics. Now, this looks kind of familiar. 1971, it doesn't have .com or .edu or .ro or anything on the end of it because we didn't have DNS yet. Computers had names. And if you've got a new computer and you wanted to put it on the net, you got it out of the box or out of the truck, and you plugged it in, you switched it on, and then you pick up the phone and you call Jake, the uh, director of the Network Information System Center at Stanford. And you say, Jake, I've got a new computer. And Jake or one of her team would be like, yeah, uh, no problem. We'll add you to the hosts file. Because there was a hosts file and it was the thing that ran the internet. And about every 18 months, most people, they would get copies of this by FTP, or if you went to visit Stanford, you'd bring one back on tape, and then you'd refresh your copy. But about every 18 months, they would print the host's file as the ARPANET resource handbook, which was a printed hard copy directory of every computer on the internet, or the ARPANET, along with the name of the person who looked after it, their email address, their street address, their phone number, this incredible incredibly rich collection of information about basically every online human being towards the, the, the end of the 1970s. Now, there are two kinds of people in the world. There's people who look at something like this and go, oh, that's really cool, I bet that's really useful. And there are people who look at this and go, I bet I can use that to make a lot of money. <laughs> this is Gary Turk. Now, <laughs> the fantastic thing about Gary <clears throat> is uh, when you punch his name into Google, the top result is his LinkedIn, because Gary is still very much alive and working in all kinds of digital messaging consultancy. Um, because 1978, when he did the thing you're about to hear about, one, it wasn't that long ago in the grand scheme of things. In the internet, that's a long time, but you know, that's the year I was born, and I'm not that old. And two, he did that when he was pretty young. And so he's still out there and you know, kicking around and working on stuff. And, and his uh, LinkedIn profile says he's the father of e-marketing. Because Gary Turk worked for Digital, the Digital Equipment Corporation. And in 1978, they just brought out a computer called the DEC System 20, looked like that. It had ARPANET built in. It had a network card. Now, this was a big deal back in 1978. And he thought, ooh. It would be good if I could sell a lot of these computers, right? Because if I sell them, I'll get a sales bonus. And he thought, I know who would want to buy an ARPANET computer. The people on ARPANET. So he got the host's file, or he got the printed book. And uh, he, he didn't send it to everyone. He, the digital had a pretty good thing on the United States East Coast, like Boston, New York. But they didn't have much on the West Coast. So he said to his assistant, I want you to go through the host's file, and I want you to just type in the email addresses of everybody on the internet, on the American West Coast, and I want you to send them an email. And they did, and they sent this email. Now, this is the first spam ever sent. At this point, they overflowed the header block. So everyone above this, they got a copy of an email that started with 250 other people's email addresses, and then says, hey, we invite you to come see the DEC system 2020 at product presentations, and there's a thing at the, the Hyatt house near the airport and everything. Now, this went out to about 450 people. And uh, 
Some of them were very, very unhappy that this had happened. You ever gone into trouble at work? You ever messed up and like one of your colleagues has kind of been like, don't do that. Or you ever, you ever got messed up so bad your boss yells at you? Has anyone ever messed up so bad the police got involved? Has anyone ever screwed up at work so badly that the United States Air Force phoned your boss and yelled at him and said, you do not use the Advanced Research Projects Agency Network for advertisements. Do you get me? I'm like, sir, yes, sir. We're really sorry, sir. We'll never do it again, sir. Now, maybe we missed a trick. I think the internet would be a better place if any time anyone sent spam, the United States Air Force got involved, you know? But we kind of missed the window on that one. All the people on the ARPANET went, you know what, actually that was kind of a dick move. We probably shouldn't have done that. Let's, let's not do marketing on email anymore. And we all quietly got on with the rest of our lives. Now, there is this thing that uh, sociologists talk about, which is uh, classifying the generations. So we talk about, you know, there are the baby boomers, and then, uh, then there were the Generation X, and then there are the millennials, and then there's Generation Z or Generation Z, and then there's Generation Alpha, and there's this weird little gap in the middle, a micro-generation, about six years, people born in this gap. Now, to me, if you are Generation X, that means you were born before Star Wars came out. And if you are a millennial, it means you were born after Return of the Jedi came out. So it's 1977, 1980, 1983. The people in the middle, Millennial Falcons, represent. And the biggest Millennial Falcon of all of them is the modern internet. Because in 1977, when Star Wars hit movie theaters, the ARPANET ran on the NCP, the Network Communication Protocol, Everything was based off the host's file, and we had never had spam before. Spam and junk email did not exist. When Return of the Jedi came out in May 1983, the ARPANET had been replaced by the internet. The internet was like five months old at this point. We had TCP IP instead of the network protocol. We had DNS. DNS was slowly being rolled out, but it existed. And junk email was a thing that happened. Now, one of the many things invented in that six-year window was the simple mail transfer protocol, which was mainly created by this guy, John Postel. And uh, this, the thing you've got to bear in mind about SMTP, it was first published in 1982, and it was incredibly successful because people started using it to communicate almost immediately. If I wanted my, uh, you know, my IBM mainframe to send email to your VAX or your PDP-11 or your mini computer, SMTP gave us a way of doing this, so it was widely adopted really quickly. And when technology has been widely adopted, if you try to launch a replacement, no one's going to use the replacement, because they're like, well, we're not going to use this, because we can't email any of those people with your system. We need a system that is compatible with that one. Now, the degree of backwards compatibility, you can go out and set up a, a Unix machine or a cloud system today, that is compatible with SMTP from 1982. This is the equivalent of going out and buying an M1 MacBook with the new Apple Silicon, and it's got a tape deck so that you can load your data from 1982, from PowerPoint version one or whatever. This degree of backwards compatibility, one, it is remarkable that it has survived as long as it has, but two, it has given us all kinds of weird stuff that as developers, we need to understand if we're gonna build software that uses email reliably. Now, let's have a little show of hands. Who's ever written code to validate an email address? Did you use a regular expression? I, I did, like a bunch of times. But it turns out that validating regular expression or email addresses with regular expressions is kind of hard. Like there's some edge cases and so on. But you think, well, maybe it's just because regex is hard to read, right? But we know what a, a valid email address looks like. Um, so let's, let's look at some examples, all right? So we're going we're gonna to talk to our friends in the Avengers. So uh, Tony Stark, uh, his email is ion.man at avengers.com. Valid? Yeah, it's pretty good, right? Um, let's have a look. Spider-Man, spider-man at avengers.com. We happy with that one? The Black Panther. T'Challa, with a little apostrophe in it. What about that one? Uh, did I hear no? Yep, no, yep. So we got Rocket and Groot, Rocket plus Groot, at Avengers.com. Yeah, yeah I, I hear some, some interesting opinions on that one. Um, what about Bruce the Hulk, at Banner, at Avengers.com? Who thinks that's valid? 
I got a, a tan, very good, I like that. And then uh, Vision is like, he doesn't need this human readable DNS. Uh, Vision is at IPv6 2001 DB8 1FF AOB DBD0. Now, every single one of these is a valid email address according to the specification. Maybe valid is not the right question. Maybe we should be asking ourselves not whether the email address is valid or not. We should be asking ourselves, is this thing actually going to work? Now, I set up a domain for this talk. So all these examples are based on real stuff that I've actually done. And an email address boils down to two things, the domain part. Where is this email going? That is the internet's problem. The internet has to get the email to the right place. And then the local part, once it arrives at the right place, what happens to it? What's going to happen when it gets there? Now, you can send email from a console using Telnet. I can go on to MS-DOS or Unix or Mac OS terminal, whatever, and I can say, hey, give me an NS lookup, so DNS lookup, and a set type equals MX. I want mail exchange records, and I want to look up fun with email. And it says, oh, here you go. These are the servers which handle internet email for that domain. So now I can go to my console. I can go Telnet, SMTP, fun with email, port 25, and it'll say, hey, nice to see you. And I'm like, hello, H-E-L-O, because hello with two L's was too much to type. DylanBT.net is me. And it's like, hey, I'm SMTP, fun with email. And we say, hey, we have mail from Dylan at DylanBT.net. And it goes, OK. And I say, recipient to hello at fun with email. Now, this is where things get interesting. Because this idea, you know, is an email address valid or not? Well, that kind of comes down to when we get to that line, is that system going to accept it? Is it going to reject it? Is it going to drop it? Is it going to, what's going to happen next? And clearly relying on the specification isn't going to get us very far when it comes to building real world systems. So I went on Google uh, and I looked up who are the best email providers for doing stupid experiments. And then I went, no, no, actually, no, let's not do that. Let's do best business email hosting. And uh, I found some interesting hits. So I, I found this article from, uh, from PC Magazine, the best hosted email providers for 2020. And it says, top four picks, best email systems, are Salesforce, GoDaddy web hosting. This one is best for Microsoft Office 360 users. Um, Zoho Mail is good for Zoho loyalists. And apparently, if you use Microsoft 365, the best email system is Teams. Now, if you don't know anything about like corporate email, this is like, imagine you looked up an article, what are the best economy family cars in 2020? And it said the Hyundai Tucson, yeah, all right, and bicycles, <laughs> and uh, Chorba di Berta, <laughs> and Penguin. And you're like, <laughs> I do not trust this journalism. But I also found quite a lot of good journalism by grown-ups who know what they're doing, which recommended a whole bunch of different systems. So I trawled through all these different recommendations. Now, disclaimer. I am about to talk about these email platforms, and I'm basically going to pull them apart and show you the points where they break. You are not. Nobody, please, go away and choose an email platform based on what I'm about to show you. Because I'm destruction testing these things, right? This is like normal people. You test a car. You drive it around. Is it comfy? What's the stereo like? What I'm doing, I'm filling the car with gravel. I'm setting it on fire. I'm throwing it in the sea. And I'm like, oh, look at that. It sank before it exploded. <laughs> Good job. So yeah, all of these systems, if what you want to do is send and receive email like a normal human being, they are fantastic. They are solid, they are reliable, they are excellent. But the ones that I, I picked for this, Office 365 is one of the big players, Google Workspace, Gmail, and all of Google hosted email. Um, Zoho Mail is very popular. They have a set of tools that a lot of people like who don't want to use the, the sort of big companies. Proton Mail is famous for having really, really good security and encryption. And Fast Mail, these are the people I've used to host my email for a long, long while. Um, now, I didn't tell any of these people I was doing experiments. I just signed up as a regular paying customer, and then I registered subdomains with all of them so I could send mail to this. So then what I wanted to do, I wanted to go through all these email addresses and see, can I register a mailbox for that character or that thing? So I went on Google. I said, can I have T'Challa? It went, yep, that's fine. I went on Office 365. That said, it's fine. I went on Zoho Mail. I put in T'Challa. It went, OK. Oh, and that's good. I clicked update, and it went error while sending response. Expected a, so it's like the front end or the, the back end supports it, but the JavaScript engineers weren't expecting an email that ends the JSON quote. Boom! So I'm going to give them a frowny face there. Um, I went on Proton Mail, T'Challa. It says nope, you can't have that. That's not allowed by policy. And uh, Fast Mail, hey, please check this. All right, no good. Rocket Plus Groot. Now it turns out. 
I couldn't register this as a mailbox on any of these platforms because of a thing called email subaddressing. Now, subaddressing is kind of weird. It comes from a draft specification from 2008, so 15 years ago, that proposed, hey, what if we could have like Dylan plus something at gmail.com or whatever, and then that'll get delivered to Dylan, but Dylan knows that the plus was there, so he can put it in a folder or deliver it to his assistant or, or whatever kind of stuff. And so this has floated around for about 15 years as a proposed standard. Um, most of these systems already supported it. So Gmail's had it since 2008. Uh, Fastmail supports it. Proton supports it. Zoho's had it for a while, although it's only documented in their forums. And Office 365 added this in May 2022. So as of now, plus sub-addressing works on all of these providers. So I've kind of given it a, yeah, that, that, it's not a mailbox, but it works. Bruce Banner, space in a quote at, no. Nobody would let me register that as a mailbox. What about, now let's, let's try some fun stuff. If we could have T'Challa, can we just have apostrophe at? And it turns out, Google goes, yeah. Office goes, yeah. Zoho Mail says invalid username, fair enough. Proton Mail says, no, you can't do that. We've already seen that. And Fast Mail says, please check this. All right, so that's not going to work. What about a single dash? Google, email cannot be a single dash. Well, can it be two dashes? <laughs> there we go. Office 365, yeah, go for it. Zoho Mail, not allowed. Proton Mail, not allowed. And when I did that on Fast Mail, it says this name's already taken, <laughs> which it's not because I just created the domain, but whatever, fast mail, you do you. So I got this whole rack of weird email addresses building up. Um, finally, can I have underscore on its own? So underscore at Gmail, yep. Underscore at office, yeah. Zoho mail, underscore add ass 101. What is ass 101? Open up the network inspector, let's take the response apart. It's a 200 okay with a bag of JSON in it that says description success. I don't know what that means. And finally, fastmail underscore at fm.funwithmemail. Great choice. <laughs> so then I thought, all right, so creating mailboxes, that, that's one thing. But a mailbox isn't the same as an address, because we can have a bunch of addresses that all end up in the same mailbox. So what if I set up a catch-all email address? I just said, look, anything at this domain, I want you to send it to, to this address here. So I set up a catch-all on all of these. And then I went through, I was like, will anything let me send mail? So I went into Gmail, and I want to send an email to, quote, Bruce Space Banner, quote, and it went, no, that, that's not recognized. And I tried it with Proton, and, and this didn't get me very far. So I kind of put this to one side. So what I learned from this whole experiment is uh, the question of validating an email address kind of comes down to this process here. Is an email address valid? Does it contain at least one at sign? No, not valid. You've got to have at least one. If it does, maybe. <laughs> now, question comes up sometimes, can email be case sensitive? I love this one. So we got three different email addresses here. Now, the domain part can't be case sensitive because DNS is not. Capital box.edu and lowercase box.edu, they are the same by design, otherwise things would have got unmanageable. But the local part, when SMTP first rolled out in the early 1980s, it was being used as a connector for people who already had mail accounts on Unix machines. And the way Unix computers work, your username has the same name as your home directory, and your mailbox file lives in your home directory, and Unix has a case-sensitive file system. So if your username is Alice with a big A, your home directory is Alice with a big A, and that's where your mailbox is. So your email had to be case sensitive because there might be Alice with a little A on the same computer as you with a different mailbox. And so that part can be case sensitive if you hate yourself and set it up on purpose. But it does mean that when Alice on her 1982 Unix machine tries to buy an airplane ticket and they turn everything into uppercase so it can fit in their Amadeus mainframe, Alice probably never gets her plane ticket because it doesn't get delivered properly. Now let's jump back a step. We were halfway through recipient to hello at fun with email. It comes back, it goes, yeah, okay. And now I'm gonna say data. I'm gonna send you some information. And I'm gonna say, yeah, it says and data with a line feed and a dot and a line feed. And I say hello, and I put a dot on its own, and it says 250, queued as, that's the message ID. I say quit, it says bye, and there we go. We've sent an email. Now, it's an email, it just says hello. It doesn't have any address information. We don't, can't see on the message who it's from. There's no headers, no to, no subject, no attachments, none of that. But it does say hello. And this is the point where I thought, hang on, 
if I can send mail by using Telnet directly into the relays, I wonder if I can get Bruce Banner to work. So I did an NS lookup for um, protonmail.funmail.net, and I Telnet it in, and I said, uh, hello, it's hello at fun with email, recipient to fun with email with spaces, and it went protocol error. So, okay, proton mail, no, 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 not gonna work. Let's try the same thing on Zoho. So I jump through the steps, I tell it in, I'm like, hello, mail from this to fun with email at, and it goes relaying disallowed. Now, I'm not relaying, this isn't being forwarded to someone else, but apparently that's just the error message that was on top of the pile when they told me to go away. Yeah, not gonna work. Let's try the same thing on Google, and we get as far as recipient to, and it says that is not a valid email address. Now, that is a lie. Google is lying, because I've read RFC 5321. That is completely allowed. But this is Google going, not only are we telling you to go away, we're telling you the internet's telling you to go away. I'm not gonna argue with Google. Life is short, you know? Let's try the same thing. Now, Microsoft was interesting, because uh, I went through the whole step, and every single machine that I could find, Microsoft was like, oh, we don't like where this email's coming from. Didn't, the address didn't matter. Microsoft have an incredibly prohibitive policy on which internet hosts are allowed to send email to them. Um, I tried this from uh, home. I tried it from every conference Wi-Fi. I tried it from a moving train in Germany. All of them just come back and said, no, that's blocked or spam house or we're not allowed relaying. But I did a version of this talk in uh, Norway earlier this year and someone saw that on YouTube and they emailed me and they said, hey, uh, I've got a server here that hasn't been blacklisted by Microsoft, so I gave it a try and this is the result. And so they went through the same steps and yep, 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 and now this is looking promising and accepted for delivery, queued for delivery, but then uh, they got a couldn't be delivered, the email box couldn't be found. So we were this close. So we got one left to try, we got fast mail. So I'm gonna tell that into them, port 25, I'm gonna go through the steps. Recipient to, okay, data. This was sent to an address with spaces in it and it worked. Queued, boom, quit, buy, and there it is. So fast mail wins the what weird email addresses will you accept. Now obviously this is no use to any normal people trying to talk to each other, but this just shows you how much variance there is in the way the five market leading providers implement the standard that supposedly governs what email addresses look like. Now, let's jump out back into the wonderful world of reality for a second and uh, we're gonna send a letter to this guy. Uh, anyone know who this is? This is uh, His Excellency, uh, Dr. Lazarus Chakwera, who is the Prime Minister of Malawi. And uh, we wanna send him a letter saying, Good, great job, Your Excellency, whatever. So uh, we're gonna do this the way I deliver mail. We're gonna put it in an envelope, and we're gonna go to Malawi. And we're gonna get off the plane, we're gonna climb to the top of the hill to the presidential palace and knock on the door and, 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 and there's no one there. Like, oh, we came all that way for nothing. Uh, should we wait? What should we do? Should we retry? Should we time out? What do we? This isn't how you send messages in reality, right? You wanna send a message in reality, you put it in an envelope, you put a stamp on it, and you post it. And the infrastructure handles the rest. Now in the real world, this works because it's expensive, because you have to pay postage and you have to buy print ink. So if you have some kind of brilliant criminal scam that relies on sending the same message to 10 million people, the Hewlett Packard ink cartridges are gonna bankrupt you before you've even got started. On the internet, this is unfortunately not true because right now in my junk mail folder, I have just this relentless stream of garbage. What we have come to call spam. And apparently we call it spam because of a Monty Python television sketch from the 70s with a bunch of Vikings singing in a cafe. I never really understood that part. But the problem, the reason why spam is such a problem is that email was invented by hippies. And hippies suck at security because they think everyone is lovely. And so there's no authentication in SMTP. There's no handshaking, no passwords, no usernames, no rate limiting, nothing. It's just like, hey man, email. Now this kind of worked, <laughs> you know, for about three decades. This was a pretty good idea. Then the 90s came around. And the 90s meant that everyone got online. It wasn't just like the, the hippies and the hackers and everyone, it was people like your parents started getting internet for the first time. And the thing you have to bear in mind about the 1990s, I was there, like I lived through, I watched this happen. I was working help desk when people were getting the internet at home who'd never had it before. 
And we were doing stuff that was too good to be true on a daily basis. Like someone would open their new email and there'd be like an email from their daughter in Australia with a picture of their new grandson who was just born yesterday. And they're like, this is amazing. Like yesterday in Australia, we didn't even have to send airmail. It just arrived right there. So they'd have this amazing mind-blowing experience and then the next email would be from Bill Gates at Microsoft saying that he teamed up with Walt Disney to give everyone a million dollars. And they're like, well, that one was true. This one's probably true as well. And so they'd click on it or they'd forward it or they'd do whatever they need to do. We had completely blown out an entire generation's kind of frame of reference for what was possible. And then we acted like it was their fault for being stupid. Well, no, no, we showed you impossible stuff and then complained that you didn't know how to tell the difference. This was completely the wrong approach. But by this point, the cat is out of the bag when it comes to junk email. Now, the good news is that in 2003, the American government passed the Controlling the Assault of Non-Solicited Pornography and Marketing Act, Can Spam, and this is why there was no junk mail after 2003, and the problem was completely solved, because Uncle Sam stepped in. Now, there's only two problems with this. One, it didn't work if you weren't in America, because <laughs> who cares? And two, it didn't work if you were in America, because who cares? Like, there's maybe one person in history actually got prosecuted under the Can Spam Act. It basically said, look, if you want to send spam, you either need to put your address in the foot or you just need to do it via a relay in Mexico or anywhere else. This accomplished nothing. The second approach, there were four ways we tried to fight spam. The second one is client-side filtering. Now, we all use this. I use it on my email. I'm sure most of you do. Gmail gives it by default, Office 365. But as a developer, I don't care about your client filtering. There is nothing my software can do to get around or work harmoniously with whatever standards you've got to set up. There's a couple of hundred people in the room. That's a couple of hundred different standards just for my email to get through to all of you. It's not cost effective. I don't care about that. The third approach is we can look at the envelope. We can say, where did this email come from? How did it get here? What does the delivery look like? And this is where I think the hippies needed a trick, because what we needed is peace, love, and authentication. When someone says, hey, I'm, I'm sending this email. Now, the outgoing, we're talking here about the outgoing thing. I want to send a message out onto the internet. So I'm going to connect to my internet provider's mail relay. This is my person. I pay them. They, they provide a service for me. So I'm going to connect to them, but I'm going to connect using, it's not the complex mail transfer. No, no, that would scare people. All complicated. It's not that either. It's extended simple. It's like simple, but not. And if any of you remembers the great 80s movie Labyrinth, extended SMTP is actually based on Labyrinth because when you connect and you initialize the handshake, you don't say hello, you say hello with the E first. And what this does is I tell that into my mail server and I say hello, DylanBT.net, and it goes, oh, cool. You speak extended SMTP. Here is the menu. Would you like any of these things? And I'm like, yeah, I would like start TLS, a transport layer security, please. And it goes, boom, all right, done, we're secure. Now what? And you're like, okay, hey, hello, me again. And it's like, right, now what do you want? And I'm like, can I authenticate, please, using this plain text, base64 encoded username and password, which is fine because we're on secure transport now. And it says, yep, I got you, bro. I know who you are. And then we can go and send mail, and the people who don't have that, they can't. Now, this works great for me sending email via Google because I'm a Google customer. Me sending email via Fastmail because I'm a Fastmail customer. It doesn't work for random strangers, and it doesn't really conform to the sort of libertarian ethos which underpinned the design of a lot of these protocols. Now, uh, this guy here, this is John Gilmore. And John is a really interesting guy. John was one of the founders of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, he's a sort of extreme libertarian cypherpunk. And his, uh, one of his most famous quotes, he says, the net interprets censorship as damage and roots around it. He's like, we designed the internet to survive, you know, catastrophic destruction of networks and cables and servers. If you try and block somebody from it, the net is just gonna route their traffic via a different route. Um, now, he was almost right, because this is a nice idea, and there's lots of examples of this. And John runs an open mail relay. He runs a server at hop.toad.com, which is out there right now, and you can go and ping it, that will, in theory, allow anyone on the planet to connect to that and use it to send email. Problem is, everyone on the planet says no. <laughs> We, we are not accepting any mail from hop.toad.com because we know the kind of people who do that. And they are spammers and they are pyramid scheme criminals and exploits and malware and all this kind of crap. 
And this is kind of the problem. Outgoing mail, we've solved pretty much by saying, look, you want to send a message, either you maintain your own server or you connect to somebody you have an account with and you validate that way, and that way it's accountable. But incoming mail, the beautiful thing about mail, I have an email address, any one of you here can email me after this talk, and I'll probably get it, and I might even reply, like in six months when I remember about it. But anyone in the world can send stuff to me and I can see it, and that would make email so fantastic. And that means, we need this, we need the kind of the letterbox that is open to mail arriving from anywhere. So how do we then, when something arrives, how can we decide whether this is legitimate or not? Now, for about 15 years, I ran my own email server. I had a physical box, I had Qmail and a Red Hat Linux installed on it, and I ran all my own email for me and about a dozen of my friends. And eventually I stopped, and the reason I stopped there are these kinds of services out there, and these are the real-time spam uh, databases. Basically, if there is a computer on the internet that is sending junk mail, it gets added to this list, and then other people's mail servers will go, okay, I'm not accepting mail from you because you're on the list. You've been naughty. And they don't maintain these lists very well. All it takes to be added to the list is for somebody to get angry and mash the button in Outlook. And all it takes to get off the list is once every seven days, you can go in and you can put in a request and you can explain what you did and all this kind of stuff and click the button and you can wait 48 hours. And you know, in the early 2000s when email was just kind of a gimmick and your bank still actually had a building you could go and talk to them, I kind of didn't mind this too much. But over the intervening decades, you know, email now is too important to run as a hobby for fun. Because you don't want to get letters from your, your bank, your doctor, your realtor, your attorney, whatever, and have them bounce because somebody accidentally mashed the button. Or because somebody who uses the same internet provider as you, they got that address yesterday and they used it to send spam and now that address has switched over to you and suddenly you're the bad guy. Doesn't work anymore. So this is one approach doesn't work terribly well. Yes, it stops spam. I'm sure it does stop a lot of spam. It also catches a lot of false positives and it's a maintenance nightmare for anyone running their own mail relay. So <coughs> we looked at the toolbox. What did we have in our 1980s era? And we're like, well, we've got this thing called DNS. And DNS is amazing. DNS is a hierarchical distributed database that basically optimizes and caches itself because the more computers we have on the internet, the more DNS servers we have to put on them, and so the whole system scales beautifully. Now, if you go onto Google's admin toolbox and you do a text record lookup for fun with email, you get this record here. This thing called the sender protection framework or the sender policy framework. And so I've published a record for the whole internet that says, look, this is fun with email. This is my domain. These are the people who are allowed to send email. I will send email from this IP address. I will send email from anyone listed in this list and anyone listed in this list, and anything else. Now, these little cryptic symbols here, a plus means this is legit, you can deliver this. A question mark means we don't care. Why they have a standard for that, I don't know. And until there is a soft fail, deliver it, but don't tag it, and then we got a hard fail. So this allows me to say, look, email coming from here is good, that's my server, I run it, I own it. These people I trust, these people I trust, anyone else, Use your own judgment. You decide whether you think this is legitimate or not. And the pass is the default, so we don't normally include the plus. So we have these policies. Now, what I love about things like the sender policy framework is it's built on DNS. It's backward compatible with the computers from 1982 with the tape decks, you know, but it solves a problem that is still very current in 2023. Now, all that stuff we've talked about, we've talked about addressing, we've talked about routing. Let's talk about what's actually inside the envelope. Now, we can send email by going, hello, and there's our data, and we can put in a bunch of headers from Dylan to, here's a subject, hello, this is a message all about how email's really fun, have a lovely day now. And it's gonna, okay, that's cute, and we quit, and that gets delivered. Now, this works brilliantly if anything you ever want to say is expressible in 7-bit American ASCII from 1965, because email is a 7-bit protocol. I know that seems astonishing in a world where emoji and Unicode is the order of the day, but email, the stuff which actually travels over the wire, only 7 bits are guaranteed to make it out the other end, because there are still probably some legacy systems that use the 8th bit as a parity check. And so, <laughs> We can send that mail. If we want to send anything more sophisticated, we need to talk about MIME, the multi-purpose internet mail extensions. And MIME fundamentally is a way of turning complicated messages into 7-bit ASCII and then rehydrating them when we get to the other end. MIME's actually pretty clever. So we're gonna say, hey, we got email from this, it's to this, subject, date, 
MIME version 1.0. Um, now, 1.0 is fun here because uh, there was supposed to be like 1.1, 1.2, 2.0, 3.0, but no one ever figured out how to ship any other versions. So 1.0 is a floating point Boolean. If it's 1.0, it's MIME, and if it's anything else, it isn't. And that's just kind of stuck there now because we don't know what to replace it with. And uh, so we need to put in this boundary here. And now this can be any sequence of characters which doesn't appear in your message. So we're going to say, hey, this is a multi-part message in MIME format. And then we're going to start a container with a little row of that, that boundary. And we're going to say, all right, so we've got a, a multi-part alternative here. Here's text plane. Bang, that goes in as one part. Here is a text HTML. That goes in as another part. Let's close the container. Let's open another container. Now we can put it in an attachment. We can put in fun with email.png. We can stick that in down the bottom. We base64 encode it. Now, MIME is actually incredibly powerful because it's a tree structure. You can have containers inside containers inside containers. So you can have a message with three different formats. You can have an English version and a Romanian version. And if your mail client's smart enough, it'll automatically display the right version with the right attachments. It's really, really smart. So, all this stuff, to build that little fun demo at the start of the talk, I had to figure all this stuff out, the bits of it that I hadn't already done as part of my job and work through all these. And the big headache with writing email into your software is you have no idea what kind of device people are going to be consuming it on. And these devices, they vary dramatically in terms of how good they are at decoding HTML. Now, there are two standards out there. If you've ever written HTML email by hand, one, I feel you, moment's silence for you. Two, there will be alcohol afterwards, it'll be fine. We now have two market leading tools. One is MJML, which is MailJet Markup. Um, the other one is uh, Foundation, and Foundation doesn't have a logo, but they do have a cuttlefish, so I thought I'd put that on the slide. And this lets you write email that looks like this. So we got MailJet Mail with MJ head and MJ body, and this is kind of nice, and it's minimalist. Then you run this through the compiler, and it generates the actual HTML that gets sent to email clients, which is a, oh, just, yeah. um, So this is tables inside tables inside tables inside tables inside tables. And the little blue bits here, those are free extra tables if you're on Microsoft Internet Explorer. Now, MJML and Foundation, they're fantastic. Problem is that they are literally templating languages. They contain no logic, no loops, no ifs, no conditionals. So real systems that I've built, I turn MailJet into something like .NET Razor, CHCHTML, at build time, and then I feed that in at runtime, populate the template, send that out, and it works on my machine. So let me give you a, we're gonna wrap up here with, with three absolute cast iron rules for working with email as an application developer. One, if you have something on your app that sends email, then put a link on the intranet, the admin page, something somewhere that you can go in and you can click it and you can say, show me what the email looks like. The reason is you can refresh that page. So when you are changing the email design and trying to debug it, you don't have to send a message, wait for it to come through, open Gmail, still doesn't look right, edit, send, wait, open, still doesn't look, you just refresh, refresh, and if hot reload works, boom, there it is. You literally change the email and, and you get the new version. So this is step one. Step two, if you're on Windows, Papercut. Papercut is a mail server that runs in your system tray, and you send email to localhost, and it goes, bing, you have a mail message, and you can go through, you can be like, show me what it looks like. Show me the headers. Show me the message body, the raw content. Show me how the MIME sections of this email break down. Show me the raw rendering here. So this is level two. And then finally, the third level before you actually go live with this thing is a service called MailTrap. And MailTrap does all the stuff Papercut does, but it does it in the cloud, and it includes a, uh, so you've got all the different representations. You also got this. This is your spam analysis. It goes through your message and it says, look, these are all the reasons why somebody might have a problem with this message. And you can see this one in here. I've got a 0.8 on one score there, because when I took the screenshot, funwith.email was only 16 days old. And it's like, oh, no, 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 new domains are a bad idea. We don't like email from fresh domains. So if you're spinning up a project for a client that's going to do a lot of emailing, you want to get the domain up and you want to start sending mail through it as early as you can so that the internet learns to trust you, because that process can take a couple of months. And finally, we get this little breakdown. This is all the features and how likely they are to work on Fastmail Desktop and Outlook for Android and all these different kinds of platforms. And uh, so you do your work and you go through the checklist. You've designed the email for your client and it looks amazing and you've checked it on every single one of these platforms and you're like, yeah, look at me, good at my job. And then you get a text from the client going, the email doesn't work properly. And I'm like, what do you mean it doesn't work properly? And they send you a screenshot. And you're like, oh, crap, dark mode. 
Yeah. Now, this to me absolutely crystallizes the kind of the, the, the dichotomy of email. Because on the one hand, we have you know, marketing companies and uh, PR people and everything who want to control the email. They want it to look good. And we as consumers, we've learned to trust mail that looks professional. If it's got colors and fonts and everything, it's trustworthy. And if it's plain text on a white background, we're like, this is probably a scam, right? We've just been conditioned to think this way. But at the same time, the capabilities of these devices, they roll out dark mode email, and suddenly, nobody had ever written a dark mode. We didn't even know this was coming. And suddenly, a whole bunch of your customers are like, ah, oh, yes, cool, dark mode. And then they're like, ah, oh, I got a blank email, and it's not blank. It's, it's black text on a black background because we had no idea this thing was coming up. And so we've had to develop a whole new set of skills and capabilities, like uh, if you've got a logo, then have a version of the logo which has a hairline around it, so if it does get reversed onto a different background. We are having to continuously develop all these techniques, and we're having to do this because email is a moving target. It is not something that anyone controls. It is not something that one corporation go, we've rolled out email 1.6, please upgrade your clients. It evolves. People are still out there reading their email in console mode things on Unix terminals. People are reading it on phones. People read it on refrigerators. People get their phone to read their email to them while they're driving. And if you are trying to control it and lock it down and make it do what you want so you can make money out of it, this is a horrible experience. But that's what I love about it. Because you can't do that. Email is the only way, pretty much the only way we have left. I can set up a server at my house, and you can set up a server at your house, and I can send you email, and you can reply to me, and that just works. And there is no one company that can shut that down or disconnect it. If I want to talk to you on WhatsApp, and one of us gets kiffed off WhatsApp, well, tough. You know, if I want to talk to you, I can't Zoom your Teams. If you're on Teams, I've got a Teams. If you're on Zoom, I've got a Zoom. If you're Google Meet, I've got a Google Meet. So I have all these apps. But email, I can read and write and send my email using whatever device I want to use on the day for the purpose that you know, I want to do that with. And uh, yeah, I think that is something rather wonderful. I think it's awesome. And I hope you've all learned a little bit about it this afternoon. Thank you.